Coming up, General Aviation comes to the rescue in Haiti. Find out how pilots sprung into action after a hurricane. An aerial harvest that brings joy to millions, Christmas trees being harvested by helicopters. We take you beyond the viral videos and into the hills for a first-hand look. Plus, remembering a legend. I want to ask Mr. Hoover, <laughs> are you looking down on, on us? You bet your ass I am. <laughs> You'll be alive this week begins right now. A gathering of storytellers, and how appropriate. Bob Hoover was the master storyteller. I think he remembered every flight he ever took and every airplane he ever was in. Two days in DC, and I never heard him repeat the same story. Now I have to tell you, he might have repeated them at the bar that night when he closed them down, but that was past my bedtime, so I wasn't there. More than 1,500 friends, and everyone Bob met was a friend, gathered in Clay Lacey's hangar to celebrate, celebrate R.A. Bob Hoover's life. Like Bob, it was sometimes irreverent. I want to ask Mr. Hoover, <laughs> are you looking down on, on us? You bet your ass I am. <laughs> Mr. Hoover, you can take care of us? You bet your ass I am, you magnificent friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, there's so many in this room there's so many people in this room who wouldn't be alive today without Bob, R.A. Bob Hoover. There, you know, he lived, he lived 10 lives. He lived 900 years. He lived the life of Abraham. He was celebrated as a man who was more interested in you than himself. It was this, his ability and desire to share lessons and hear about yours. It was obvious that Bob was all about giving back and making others better as opposed to pontificating and talking about himself. Treated generals and line service personnel as equals. Never a bad word about anybody. Uh, gave everyone benefit of the situation. Most gentlemanly person I've ever known. Most even personality uh, as well. Names you know were there too. I think what we need to do now is consider what Bob might want us to do with our lives, the time that's left to us. And one of those things that I feel strongly that he would be pressing us to do would to be, would to, be to make opportunities in aviation available for young people in this country, to create a climate for aviation that is more is friendlier than it is uh, today to give young people the opportunity to make uh, make a career in aviation whether it's flying or any other support uh, of aviation so many of the speakers said that bob hoover had saved their lives one of the best things that ever happened to the united states air force was when he got out <laughs> because in his capacity as civilian he was able to influence more pilots and save more pilots' lives than anybody else. Uh, I am privileged to be here and know that. And all I can say is, rest well, my friend. Thank you very much. And for Bob Hoover, it was a life well lived. I said, Bob, what are we going to say for you? And Bob said, well, Bill, I just want everybody to know that I was the luckiest guy in the world, not for the things that I did, but for the hundreds of true friends that I have. And he said, he used to always joke, and he said that that old grim reaper had been chasing him for years, and that son of a bitch ain't got him yet. <laughs> and he said, but when he does catch me, that undertaker is going to have a hell of a problem. And I said, well, Bob, what's that? He said, getting a shit-eating grin off of my face. <laughs> Godspeed, Thank you. Bob. Thank you. Out on the ramp, a military ceremony in honor of Bob Hoover's many years of service from World War II fighter pilot and prisoner of war to military test pilot and a flyover of some of the aircraft that had an important role in Bob's life.
amazing ceremony. What an incredible guy, as we've said that before on the show. Um, but to see uh, so many people who knew him so well come out and talk about the remarkable life that he led, it was, it was really moving to be there, I gotta tell you. A very fitting tribute to an, yeah. an amazing aviator. Yeah, very well done. AOPA joined an esteemed class of aviation and aerospace pioneers last week. The International Air and Space Hall of Fame at the San Diego Air and Space Museum inducted your association and seven others last week. Joining AOPA on the honored hallway will be the Apollo 15 astronaut Al Warden, the Boeing Company, Coast Guard Aviation, Aviation and Space Pioneer Dale Myers, the non-scheduled airlines, Orbis International Flying Eye Hospital, and the founders of the Plains of Fame Air Museum in Chino. But it's about the future that excites me the most, and the opportunity about bringing youth into aviation, high school programs which will be kicking off very, very soon, what we call a You Can Fly, upgrading the education we call general aviation training, get your pilot's license. You know, bringing rusty pilots back into aviation and creating low-cost opportunities in flying called flying clubs, called You Can Fly. Aviation and general aviation is strong. It will get stronger thanks to all the support of all the hundreds of thousands of members of AOPA. We remain strong and the freedom to fly is alive and strong thanks to you and the You Can Fly efforts at AOPA. Thanks much. AOPA joins luminaries like the Wright brothers, Bessie Coleman, Bill Lear, and of course, Bob Hoover. The San Diego Air and Space Museum ranks among the best museums of its type in the U.S. AOPA Live's Warren Morningstar shows us around. We're easily in the top four of air and space museums in this country, and I'll tell you, the experience that we provide to the guests, I think, is absolutely world-class. You'll find the San Diego Air and Space Museum in Balboa Park, right under the departure path for Lindbergh Field. Now, the A-12 Blackbird out front tells you that you're about to experience something unique. It's a story of great people or teams of people that accomplish so much together. I mean, when you think of what we see there and the, um, uh, the history of aviation and space, at the technology and innovation growth in this world, it mirror images aviation and space. The Apollo 9 command capsule greets you as you enter. North American Rockwell built it up the road in Downey, California. Now across from the spaceship, an aircraft with even closer ties to San Diego, Orion M2 variant. Now this is a flying replica, meaning that three of the craftsmen who built the original Spirit of St. Louis helped build this one. The museum collection represents all of the milestones of flight, from the early experiments through the two world wars and modern space flight. And while the museum is about history, it's also about the future. So if you notice in the front of the museum when you walk in, uh, it says enter for fun. While we've got them having fun, we can do an awful lot with them to help inspire them, you know, promote their interests certainly in not just aviation and space, but technology, you know, that once again, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Because not everybody's going to be a pilot or an aerospace engineer, but maybe a nurse, a doctor, a biotech researcher, you know, maybe they take that extra math and science course that is so, so important in the future of their lives as well as our uh, our world. In San Diego, Warren Morningstar, AOPA Live. You can find out more about the San Diego Air and Space Museum and its amazing collection of aircraft at their website. The Air Safety Institute and the University of North Dakota are studying a different way to fly the traffic pattern. The study looks at the possible safety benefits of flying a circular pa traffic pattern instead of a traditional rectangular pattern. A continuous turn from downwind to final could provide increased stability, reduce pilot workload, and a constant bank angle throughout the maneuver. It could also reduce the likelihood of overshooting base to final turns. It's too early to say for sure if the new traffic pattern would be safer. UND and the Air Safety Institute are hopeful the results will be available at the beginning of 2017. More bad news for NavWorks in their dispute with the FAA over certain models of their ADS-600B, ADS-B transceiver. The FAA issued an emergency order suspending the company's authorization to manufacture the units. The FAA says the order comes after NavWorks repeatedly didn't allow FAA inspectors into their facilities. 
The FAA already proposed an AD that would require owners of the affected units to remove them from their airplanes. All of this a result of the FAA saying the devices do not meet TSO requirements and as a result they could send unreliable position information. When we come back, pilots helping hurricane victims in Haiti find out how airplanes answered the call. Plus, pulling pitch so you can deck the halls. The helicopter Christmas tree harvest. The OPA Live this week continues. There are many important things to consider before purchasing an aircraft. Let the experts at Aerospace Reports help guide you through the process. We combine expert knowledge with our long-standing commitment to personalized customer service to perfect your transaction. Learn more at aerospacereports.com. For some, flying can be a spiritual experience. You may remember Robert De Laurentiis. He flew his airplane around the world last year. He's got a new book out, Zen Pilot, Flight of Passion and the Journey Within. It takes a look at the spiritual aspects of flying and making a round the world journey. It's out now on Amazon. You can also get it from Aircraft Spruce and through a special light speed promotion. And on his globe circling trip, Robert learned a few things about survival. These survival tips can apply to cross country jaunts as well. Hi, I'm Robert De Laurentiis, Sen Pilot, and this is the Spirit of San Diego. I circumnavigated the globe in 2015 and learned many survival tips that can be useful to every general aviation pilot. One of the survival tips that I learned on my circumnavigation of the planet was to take along a satellite texting and emailing device. And what this did was in critical situations, it allowed me to get the help of other experts, no matter where I was on the planet. In one situation, I was 600 miles off the coast of California and my engine started to overheat. I was able to text my mechanic and he made suggestions that lowered the engine temperature and got me home safely. This device is also a personal locator beacon. It's made by Garmin. It's called the Delorum InReach Explorer and they cost about $300 and they have monthly monitoring plans that range anywhere from $30 on up to $99. It's a critical piece of survival gear. I'm Robert De Laurentiis, Zen Pilot, and we'll be back next week with another survival tip for general aviation pilots. As we approach this Thanksgiving holiday, we take a moment to be thankful for the blessings in our lives while also looking at ways to help others. AOPA corporate pilot Mark Evans did just that, volunteering with Remote Area Medical. The nonprofit group brings disaster relief and medical care to people around the world. Mark flew a Cessna caravan on several missions to provide hurricane relief in Haiti. AOPA Live's Warren Morningstar had a chance to talk to Mark about his experience. Tell me a little bit about the Remote Area Medical. Remote Area Medical is a nonprofit organization out of Knoxville, Tennessee, and it's founded by a gentleman, Stan Brock. He uh, started the organization, uh, I think it was in the mid 80s, and uh, it's an uh, organization that is run totally by volunteers and uh, by donations. And this was so. in the wake of the hurricane that they needed yes, help? Yes, absolutely. So uh -huh. they, need, they were in need, they're in need of food, they're in need of uh, any medical supplies that they can. Mm -hmm. so. so how many missions did you fly? Throughout that week, weather pending, we flew, I think, six missions back and forth, mm -hmm. and we delivered is a couple thousand pounds of uh, food mm -hmm. uh, either way. And between us and remote area medical Cessna 206, by the time that I was there, we were able to airdrop and deliver 23,455 meals. So it was, we, were, we did a, uh, a large work, a great work down there. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your background. What prepared you for this? It's interesting. I, th I think it was a perfect fit for it because I started my career flying as, as a, for lack of better terms, a freight dog. So I was used to flying caravans. I've over 3,000 hours in caravans. And, and so I'm used to just getting in and getting the job done, putting the freight in, getting it secured, mm -hmm. and then if whatever it takes to get done, get done. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to uh, other pilots who might want to volunteer for an organization like this? The biggest advice is, is get your airplane in order and um, don't hesitate in calling groups like Missionary Aviation Fellowship and also the remote area medical and they are in need of supplies. They are in need of pilots to, to help out. To me, throughout my 16,000 hours of flying, I think it's the most worthwhile thing I've ever done with flying. I think it was personally responsible for saving people's lives by you know, providing services, providing the flying services. And 
being able to get to food, get food to people who will not be able to get food because the infrastructure is not there. Bridges are wiped out. There's villages that are either totally gone or they're totally isolated from people. So, so what was the most memorable thing of this experience? Probably the most vivid is seeing the conditions that you know humankind can survive in and in the the what they call their main roads and, and the infrastructure in the town is pretty um, pretty startling. When we would do a, a, an airdrop of food on the beach, by the time we got turned around to go do another drop, there'd be 200 people there scrambling for the food, a couple hundred people. And just, you can just see them coming out of, just coming out of nowhere. So it's pretty, um, pretty dramatic, pretty, pretty uh, eye-opening. I think there's a, it's, it's almost this profound sadness that you kind of feel it, because a lot of these people are not going to get helped, but we can, we've got to do what we can to help these folks. So you do it again? Absolutely. I, it's not that I would do it again, I will do it again. This is general aviation to me at its best and being able to help people who can't get it any other way. Well, we thank you for doing it, Mark. Wow. And, and as Mark said, there still is a great need for aid in Haiti, and you can find out how you can help on the Remote Area Medical website. Well, it's a big step forward for renewable energy. The Navy has flown a jet on 100% renewable biofuel. This is a photo of the takeoff from Naval Air Station Patuxent River. The EA-18G Growler flew on a product called ReadyJet, according to a press release by the company who makes it. Applied Research Associates says the biofuel performed just like JP-5. Much like the transition to unleaded avgas in the civilian fleet, the military is looking for ways to switch to renewable fuels. Speaking of renewable fuels, another step toward powered flight for the Sunflyer. Aero Electric Aircraft says they have started powered testing of the all-electric trainer. The all-composite two-seater was unveiled in May. The airplane's solar cells are designed to supplement external charging of batteries. The company says the Sunflyer can fly for three hours using about a dollar of electricity per hour. So, how cool is that? Cool and, and cheap. <laughs> can you imagine, though, going out for a flight, you know, around uh, the neighborhood or a, or a lesson with a student or something like that, coming back in, instead of calling the fuel truck, you plug it into the wall. So, I like you know, it. Buck an hour, that's not bad. That's a good deal. Well, hey, when we come back, you're not the only one with holiday plans. Find out where the president-elect will have an impact on airspace. You've probably seen the viral videos of choppers slinging trees. We take you to the mountains of Oregon for a first-hand look. Meet the pilots who fly with AOPA Insurance. They love flying and saving money, just like you. At AOPA Insurance, we understand how you fly and provide the coverage you need to keep on flying. Call for a free quote and see which AOPA Insurance plan is right for you. Welcome back. For many of us here in North America, winter is making an appearance this week. So if you're heading south for sunshine and warm weather, a heads up. There's a TFR for President-elect Donald Trump. The POTUS-to-be will be spending his turkey day in Florida. And there's a three-mile TFR around Mar-a-Lago Club in West Palm Beach. Remember, check your NOTAMs before you fly. Millions of people across the United States are going to be putting up a Christmas tree in coming days. And for those west of the Mississippi River, there's a good chance it will come from Oregon's Will Amet Valley. If it does, its trip to their house starts on a helicopter sling. AOPA Live's Paul Harrop put on his hiking boots to show you how general aviation serves Christmas. It's harvest time on Noble Mountain. A flurry of work fills slope and sky. The air fresh with the scent of fir trees and turbine exhaust. The sounds of hard work and chopper blades are deafening. Men gather cut trees and pile them together so they can be lifted up on slings and taken to your living room by way of the central Oregon skies. The steep terrain makes it impossible to harvest these trees any other way. We have some very challenging terrain up here. 60% slopes get slick with mud. The farm goes on as far as the eye can see. This farm is a, an extremely large farm. It's about two miles long. For Bob Schaefer and his staff at the Noble Mountain Tree Farm, 
helicopters are the only way to get the job done. We have high expectations of our pilots. We want good production pilots. We're working literally seven days a week, daylight to dark. It's an all-day effort, and it's anything but routine. On a perfect run, the helicopter is in constant motion. The pilot slinging the hook to a man on the ground, who latches the bundle and then gets out of the way. It's one constant torque turn in a dance between the field and the truck. This mountain may be scenic, but it's anything but a joyride. You're no longer flying the aircraft, you're flying the hook. Ty Burlingham is the chief pilot for Precision Helicopters. He's leaning out the door of this Bell Jet Ranger, waging war on the wood below with Cyclic and Collective. So as soon as you come off the truck, your head goes out into the field, trying to find your hook tender. Uh, when the fields are clear cut like the one we've been in today, it's a lot easier. Um, you're looking for the high-vis vest and just head right toward them. Uh, after that, you want to get an idea of where your hook's at. So is it swinging behind you? Is it left or right? And you want to kind of get the hook centered underneath the aircraft before you decelerate into the hook tender. And then once you start your deceleration, you're kind of steering the hook right to his hand. At least that's the goal. The motion continues to a waiting truck. They may look big, but it's not an easy target. As a couple of pilots have said who've just begun, it's like trying to, you know, fly, fly into a postage stamp. Not only do these pilots have to be precise, they need to be fast. Every second the helicopter is flying costs the farm about 24 cents. So yes, they measure it in seconds. They expect each chopper to pull between six and 10,000 trees every day. Each load is between six and 15 trees, targeting 600 pounds of festive fur per 20 second haul. Helicopters have the capacity to, to lift more, but it's more efficient to have, have five or 600 pounds where they can move quickly rather than be having to fight the helicopter to stay in the air. It's a delicate balance requiring unique utility flying skills, but the labor is rewarded with smiles of strangers the pilots never even get to see. It's fun to think about how many thousands of families we touch with this aircraft every year. It's extremely gratifying to grow Christmas trees. Our first year in business, we developed a tag and it said this tree was grown expressly to bring the joy of Christmas into your home. And that's our philosophy. A joy of Christmas with beautiful trees, slung by skilled pilots. In the Eola Hills near Salem, Oregon, Paul Harrop, AOPA Live. Pretty amazing flying there. Can you believe that? I, I had not seen that before. I, I guess it's a viral thing on, <laughs> online, but that's, that's amazing. I guess so. That's incredible what they do with the helicopters. Well, hey, that's it for this week. We're genuinely thankful for your viewership and your membership. None of this would be possible without you. We hope your holiday season is filled with joy no matter how you celebrate. Join us next Thursday for another AOPA Live This Week.